Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Burble, Director of the Huntsville Madison County Emergency Management Agency. It is Wednesday, September the 8th. On behalf of Mayor Tommy Battle, Mayor Paul Finley, Commission Chairman Dale Strong, Huntsville Area Government Health Care, and our emergency response agencies, we bring you this, our communities, we bring you this briefing on our community res response to COVID-19. Our speakers today will be Dr. Pam Hudson, CEO, Crestwood Medical Center, and Mr. Steve Miley, Associate Director, Marshall Space Flight Center. At this point, I'll give the current numbers. Uh, in the state of Alabama, there's 732,151 cases of COVID. Uh, in Madison County, 45,826 having resulted in 557 deaths. Uh, current positive, positivity rate in Madison County is 20.5%. Uh, at this point, we'll go to our first speaker, Dr. Pam Hudson from Crestwood Medical Center. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon. Um, numbers are a difficult thing to interpret. Uh, those are big numbers that we just heard, and they have really not a tremendous amount to do with what's happening today or this week um, in our local community. And, and to try to put things in perspective, you know, Alabama is a very large state. And our southern um, counties experienced a tremendous surge that started well before ours, and they actually are, uh, looks like they're beginning to start trending down. In other words, they've hit the peak of their surge and may be coming back off of that a little bit. That's not the situation in central and north Alabama. We started our surge uh, a bit later, probably lagged by a couple, three weeks. So um, the predictions show that we are due to cap out uh, and, you know, to kind of reach the peak of, of the surge. Unfortunately, the, uh, it does appear that we're taking the, the more severe track of the prediction uh, because we haven't yet peaked and we are, looks like we're peaking at a higher, uh, higher number than what was initially um, anticipated. Um, today, our county hospitals have 260 COVID inpatients. Uh, and um, all of your county hospitals uh, are um, curtailing elective inpatient surgeries because our staffs are completely consumed um, with taking care of the normal illnesses plus the, the COVID surge. Um, the uh, patients are sick. Uh, our total number of ICU patients is 66, and that is um, that is exceeds our ICU capacity. So um, all the hospitals are caring for these ICU patients in settings that are um, still very safe and still very high tech, but they're not in the usual places. If you were to visit a hospital in non-pandemic times, you would um, you would go to one or two or three units and, and not, uh, not be, for example, um, Crestwood has a COVID um, ICU in the emergency department um, as a, the part of the, the ER and the other hospitals are doing similar types of things. Um, the number of ventilated patients is 47. That is a higher percentage of ICU patients than even we saw last winter. So again, a, a, a very disastrous disease in those who go into the second phase of the illness. Um, in, our, in our county, we've had four deaths in the last uh, 24 hours, and you look at about a week's worth, um, the deaths, uh, deaths were about 20. Um, the, uh, at, uh, it, it does appear that in uh, the patients who have expired, they're, they're unvaccinated. Uh, so um, this is a disease that is, uh, can be addressed through vaccination. Uh, there are seven pediatric cases in the county uh, in the hospital currently. Um, the Delta variant, as I mentioned, is, uh, is very controllable with uh, increased vaccination rates. Uh, we probably need another 50,000 in our county to get vaccinated before we reach a point where um, this thing will stop uh, spreading around the community. And of course, you can't vaccinate children under 12. So uh, the Delta variant does appear to be pretty, um, uh, pretty rampant among uh, uh, children this go around, whereas it was not the case in the winter. Uh, the vaccine is safe. I have to remind you of that. The FDA has issued a full approval for the Pfizer vaccine and expected to do the same for the Moderna and the J&J &J, uh, and get them off the emergency use authorization and into the fully fully approved. So, And then there are very, very few medical contraindications to vaccination with the COVID vaccine. Um, it is okay to get it with the flu vaccine. So uh, don't you don't have to put off one or the other. And there's plenty of vaccine to go around. Um, I will remind you that if you are somebody who 
is moderately or severely immunocompromised, and that's a decision you, and discussion you have with your doctor to see if that uh, if you fit into that category. And a third dose is is currently recommended. Um, again, making sure that uh, the folks who have a little bit more of a difficult time mounting a response, a positive response from the vaccine because of their underlying conditions, that third dose is, uh, is uh, showing to be very helpful. Um, the booster is uh, lots of talk. Uh, it, we expect it to be approved at the end of September for the Pfizer vaccine. And just like when the, va the vaccinations rolled out, the Moderna was about got it, its approval two to three weeks after Pfizer did. So we an fully anticipate that um, the first part of October, the Moderna will be um, uh, approved for the booster shot. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that, that these are, the vaccines continue to be highly effective against serious illness, um, hospitalizations, and death. Uh, they continue to be very, very effective in the 96 plus percent uh, most of the patients in the hospital are not vaccinated. 90% of the COVID cases uh, are, are trending at unvaccinated. Uh, but studies are showing over time that for asymptomatic infection and mild infection, the, the protectiveness of the vaccine does seem to wane. That is the reason for the booster dose. It, it not only will it help us now, but it will help us with the next surge. And hopefully we will have a much more blunted surge the next go around. Um, and, and I think we can expect that that will happen until we are pretty much fully, fully vaccinated. And if you're like me and watched some football this weekend, um, it certainly is cause for concern that we would be uh, vulnerable to another peak because I didn't see um, a whole lot of social distancing and not much masking. And uh, so we cross our fingers that we get our vaccinations up um, and, and take action to do that. Um, it is uh, getting the booster as soon as it's released and approved at that eight month time frame after your last dose uh, or your second dose or your uh, dose of the J&J, &J, um, you want to move quickly on that. This isn't something that just like with the vaccinations, oh, well, I'll wait and see, maybe we won't have another surge or oh, I'll wait, the time isn't right. The, the vaccine helps, uh, so please let's let's get uh, let's get everybody vaccinated. Another key issue that we're seeing right now, in addition to the vaccination rates not being where we need them to be, is the use of the monoclonal antibody. And this is a good good time for me to remind you of how COVID works. When COVID finds a vulnerable person and goes on to provide a significant illness, something that you're not saying, gee, I wonder if I have it, but that you, you know you're sick with it, um, that first phase of the illness lasts about seven to 10 days. Most people get well and keep getting well and don't go on to what is the second phase, which is not really the virus alone. It is your body's response to the virus and the body actually begins to do damage to itself. The monoclonal antibody gives you just-in-time antibodies during that first phase or what's called the viral phase. So it is important if you're going to make yourself, um, if you're going to seek care, uh, that you want to be, you want to do it in time, so that the monoclonal antibodies can help. So the, uh, the good news on this is that there is a good supply locally. Uh, the more difficult news is that across the country, and certainly in this in this state as well, there are not very many sites that can offer it. Again, trying to keep the supply good at at the limited number of sites. So if you try to uh, get the monoclonal antibody on the on the order of your physician. Um, you may, I, I'll warn you in advance, it may, there may be some frustration trying to get an appointment uh, because there are a lot of people that are um, having to take advantage of, of that. So who should get monoclonal antibody? Well, first of all, you can be either vaccinated or unvaccinated. It works really well in both cases. Secondly, um, if you are at high risk uh, of either a significant exposure and you are a vulnerable person. So we've gone over that a bunch. Um, somebody who has uh, is immunocompromised, of advanced age, has other chronic illnesses, obesity, diabetes, pulmonary disease. Um, if you have any of those conditions, you would be uh, considered to be a, a, a perfect candidate for the monoclonal antibody if you are, uh, if you get, um, if you contract COVID. Um, the other group is if you are significantly sick with COVID, 
and seemed to be getting sicker instead of better. And again, in that short window in the seven to 10 days, um, this, there, this would be a subset. And in that case, it doesn't really matter if, you, um, if you're in a risk category or, or not. You sort of have fallen into a risk category because you're not shaking the virus as quickly as you would hope. So the bottom line is if you're young and healthy and you have a moderate um, illness with that, you may go have a test, find out you're positive. You may not be a candidate for monoclonal antibody, but if you fall into one of those groups that we talked about just now, then you would be a candidate. So here's the tricky thing. You're, uh, whether you're in a risk group or not, you go, you, the, the doctor says, yes, you've got COVID, and then uh, and go home and, and try to get well, and you go home and you don't get well. You need to go back to the doctor. You need to contact your health care provider because now you're falling into that risk group, and there is a time sensitivity. You want to get the monoclonal antibody before um, five to seven days from the initial onset of symptoms. Um, so that's just a, we, we have seen in the ERs, we are seeing patients who went early to their uh, physician, um, got tested, found out they were positive, continued to get worse, did not go back, and then get to the point where they have to go to the emergency department. At that point, they typically need oxygen and need to be admitted, and those, you're no longer eligible for the, you can't, now we're into the second phase of illness, and there are other medicines for that, so. Um, just a, uh, a word to the to the wise there. Monoclonal antibodies are available at Crestwood at Huntsville Hospital in, in Huntsville, and also um, I'm told that they will soon be converting, uh, soon like today or tomorrow, be, be converting the Madison uh, Hospital Wellness Center so that it will um, also be offering the monoclonal antibodies. Um, there, there typically is... Uh, the, the difficulty is, is the demand is high and the supply sites are uh, fairly low. Um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, a, a very common question and one that is making it difficult to manage um, the COVID cases that we're seeing in quite a large number right now, and that is when should you get tested? So there's a difference in, um, it depends on what the situation is. So if you are um, exposed to someone who tests, subsequently tests positive or was actually sick when you were around them and they failed to mention that to you, um, then it doesn't do any good to run out and get tested right that minute. Really, the test window is somewhere between three and five days after that exposure. So just going, say, oh, I was around Sue and, and Sue had um, tested positive for COVID and it was yesterday, I go to, I'm very likely to be negative. That's going to be falsely reassuring because if I was exposed to Sue yesterday, I need to get tested in three to five days, and in that period of time, I don't need to be around anybody because during that period of time, if I'm going to be infected, then I'm going to get it, and then I'll be spreading it around. So it doesn't help to get tested immediately. It does help to quarantine yourself and get tested at the, the highly suspect time. If you have symptoms, that's a good time to get tested. Symptoms that are uh, that that are um, loss of uh, the sense of taste or smell. Uh, of course, even if you tested negative in that circumstance, everyone would consider you had COVID. Um, but uh, but let's say sniffles or um, a little headache, um, all those things that not in the pandemic you wouldn't have sought care um, now might be might warrant a test. So so that would be uh, and and of course you'll remember that if you are tested you must quarantine until the results come back negative. I'll say that again because so many people get tested and, and then they tell the people that they're around, oh, I just went and I got tested. Holy smokes, you got tested? Um, so you're infecting everybody else if you turn out to, to be positive. Um, and then again, as I mentioned with the monoclonal antibody, if you're sick, and especially if you have, are an at-risk person, um, that's when you want to get the monoclonal antibody. They are very effective in, in that window. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude with uh, my, my usual, um, and everybody can probably say them now. First, please get vaccinated um, and get the booster as soon as it comes out. The science is behind the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine. Mask, there are a ton of studies out there that demonstrate that masks protect both the wearer and the person that's, that you're around. And, and so if everybody's masked, we significantly restrict the ability of that virus to jump person to person. And at this point, you know, six feet is still a really good strategy and that works as well. The virus has no legs. 
and it doesn't have arms and it doesn't weave a web. It's traveling by contact. And then the last thing is um, make sure you're washing your hands and the hands of every child that you're around. So um, thank you, Jeff. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. Now we'll go to Mr. Steve Miley from the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate you having, having me. Um, also wanted to, to give a huge thank you and shout out to all of our public health professionals ha that have been working for so long and so diligently on this pandemic. Um, currently, I wanted to just share a little bit about what's going on at Marshall Space Flight Center. Currently, we are in what we call stage two of the NASA framework for return to on-site work. And what that means really translates to mandatory telework for most of our employees and uh, extra safeguards for those who are working on-site at Marshall. The framework that we're using was introduced back when the pandemic began in March of 2020, and there are four stages in the, in the, in the uh, framework. So of the four, again, we're down to two, one being the least severe, four being the worst, uh, the worst uh, restrictions or the most severe restrictions. Right now, we are uh, operating with about 25% of our workforce on site, which translates out to about 15 to 1,800 people coming on site per day. Uh, the rest of our workforce, around 5,200 folks, are teleworking. Um, we found that using this kind of hybrid approach between the teleworking and then the on-site work in our labs and our development manufacturing areas that we're able to, to keep the mission going. Uh, we've also had an updated policy requiring uh, regarding face coverings. Uh, we are requiring face coverings now for all those who are working on-site when, when they're indoors, even for those that are fully vaccinated. And all of this, again, is about keeping our employees safe and, and, and the agency operating during the pandemic. Uh, we're constantly looking at a variety of factors. Going forward, uh, we're taking into advice, our advice from our NASA headquarters, uh, the CDC, as also collaborating with our partners in the area here at Redstone Arsenal and the local community. We're keeping track and monitoring what's going on in our hospitals and so on. And our leadership folks are really committed to doing all that we can to safeguard our employees, especially those who are coming on site to work each day. Uh, we were recently voted, which was a nice thing, voted by our employees among federal agencies to have the, the best COVID response. And again, you know, NASA is not about trying to be the best at COVID. But we're, we're glad and we're happy for our employees that they feel that, that it's been an effective response to the pandemic. And of course, what we really, like all of us, want to get back to is what we're, what we're really working on in our mission. So um, as far as testing goes, uh, recent guidelines from the Safer Federal Work Task Force have come out, again, federal-wide type of implementation where uh, we're requiring uh, safety protocols for those that are vaccinated and those that are not. And so for the federal employees, civil servants, and our federal on-site contractors, whether you're working on-site or not, you're being asked to complete what we're calling a certification of vaccination status. And again, that's not something unique to NASA. It's federal-wide. And the certification of vaccination status has four choices. You can state that you're fully vaccinated, vaccinated but not yet fully vaccinated, not va vaccinated at all, or even choice number four is you choose not to answer. And so right now at the Marshall Space Flight Center, we've got about 96% of our employees have responded to, uh, to the data call to what's called the attestation. And of those, about 78% of those that have responded have indicated that they are fully vaccinated. As part of, as well as part of the new, the new guidelines that we're implementing within NASA, and again, these are federal wide. Anyone coming onto our site, NASA, NASA facilities, will be required to be tested weekly for COVID-19 if they are not fully vaccinated. As well um, as of September 6th for on-site visitors, they are also required now to carry a certification of vaccination as well as a COVID-19 test record to come on site as a visitor. Um, and again, like Dr. Hudson said, we are still continuing to encourage and doing everything we can to encourage our employees and encourage everyone uh, who is eligible to go out and, and get that vaccine. 
Uh, the last thing I wanted to just mention is we are expecting to, to keep operating in what we're calling stage two. We don't anticipate moving backward in the stages up to stage three or stage four at this point. Uh, in, in which case we would reduce the amount of people on site. We've got folks wearing masks inside. We've got folks that are able to be vaccinated now. And we've got our ability to check uh, for vaccination or for the, for the uh, vax, uh, I'm sorry, not the, for, the, for the virus with the COVID-19 testing. So we feel like we've got good strategies in place to keep our folks safe as they do come on site every day. That's pretty much my update. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for watching today. Uh, our next scheduled briefing is next Wednesday, September 15th. Uh, I would like to make a note that the time will change from 1 to noon. Uh, but until that time, critical updates will be posted to the City of Huntsville's COVID-19 webpage, as well as the webpage of our other partners here today. Until then, stay safe, stay separate, and remember to sanitize. At this point, we'll take questions. Uh, as always, as you come to the mic, please identify yourself and who you're affiliated with, and we'll allow one question and a follow-up. Good afternoon, Dallas Parker with News 19. Hopefully you can hear me okay with my mask on. Um, my questions are for Dr. Hudson. First and foremost, I want to ask you, I don't know if you've seen, but Idaho has started rationing care by implementing crisis standards of care. What does that look like for a hospital? And if you had a scale of one to 10, where 10 is where crisis standards begin, where would you say we are here in Madison County? Crisis standards is a place that I hope we never have to go. Uh, and I, we are not in crisis standards as in the vernacular of the industry. Um, we are still able to care for every patient at the level that um, we would normally. It just is exceedingly difficult and our, our staff, as you might imagine, are tired um, and, and uh, we're watching to make sure that the surge doesn't uh, doesn't eclipse again the community is the one that really has the controls uh, in this and that is through vaccination efforts and so um, true crisis standards are the kinds of things that we from time to time hear about for example in the uh, the horrific hurricane uh, years ago where they simply could not evacuate everybody from um, some of the hospitals so that that was a time where there were at crisis standards um, so again, I, we're not there, and uh, we hope to stay clear of that. And I, I can assure you that every healthcare operator is working hard to make sure that we don't have to go there. Uh, looking at every uh, every uh, process and policy and uh, an approach that we can manage, um, I, I do think it's important to to reiterate that the community really holds the keys to keeping us out of that, and that is through vaccination, getting the boosters, um, masking, keeping healthy, and uh, because our children can't be vaccinated, and they are proving to be a pretty good vehicle for transmission. They're both getting it and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and spreading it. So that is tricky, whereas in the last, last time, we were worried about the elders, the very vulnerable elders, and that's who got it quickly and, and um, disastrously. Um, now, most of those folks are vaccinated and it's the, the younger end of the spectrum. So, um, so again, for folks in the middle, it's the, the burden is on you. Get vaccinated so you can stop transmitting and, and spreading the virus, and we can stay out of that territory that we, we certainly hope that we don't end up in. Gotcha. My follow-up is regarding staff, and you sort of um, – you know, mentioned that earlier. Um, I'm sure you've seen we have nurses in Birmingham protesting for better wages, safer and healthier work environments. These situations tend to spark other protests elsewhere. We haven't seen any yet here, but are your nurses frustrated with the pay versus um, contracted maybe travel nurses? Are they paying, being paid less? And what other complaints are you really hearing from your nursing staff? Well, that's a, a very multi-part question. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the answers that I can give you to that are, number one, yes, our staff is frustrated. We are dealing with a disease that is preventable, and the community, we, and, and we, we haven't prevented it. We have a, an effective vaccine, and people are not taking advantage of it. So that leads to frustration. And imagine, it doesn't take much to imagine how frustrated the community is with being cooped up, not being able to do business as usual, having to wear the mask, having to distance, having sick kids, trying to figure out how to work and, and quarantine. And so the, the, the 
process of care is much more difficult now than it would be in, I'm going to say, normal times, pre-pandemic times. Um, yes, a lot of, uh, of, of drama and high stakes pressure in a hospital, but now add the pandemic and all the difficulties with that. So I think that is the, the most critical piece at this point. Most hospitals have um, adopted some, um, some, some ways to try to help staff, either by uh, trying to bring in outside labor, but guess what? This isn't an Alabama pandemic. It's the whole country. So there is a, a countrywide, possibly worldwide shortage of health care providers. So all the money in the world can't educate a nurse in six months when it takes uh, longer to do that. So um, it is a, a, a bit of a perfect storm for those kinds of concerns. Uh, I am very grateful that I know in this community we have been able to provide safe workplace environments. We've had enough PPE. We've had the community stepping up and providing early on when those resources were scarce. Uh, now they're not scarce, and so everyone is protected. Now the, now the challenge is getting everybody to use all the protections, but it's, it's not that uh, the, the initial piece where worker safety was, was critical. There have been very few in-hospital transmissions of COVID. In fact, I'm not aware of any at our facility, and I haven't heard of any um, anywhere else. So, uh, the, but, but our healthcare workers are part of the greater community. And, and so, uh, so that they are exposed outside of work and, and then are on the sidelines. So it is a very tough time, and, um, and people are tired. Hello, Madison Scarpino with WAFF 48 News. My question is also for you, Dr. Hudson. Um, I know you said that COVID is rampant among children this go around. Can uh, you talk about, are the children who are hospitalized typically ones with underlying health conditions or are they perfectly healthy, normal kids? And can you elaborate a little bit more on COVID cases among children in North Alabama? Um, we aren't a, a pediatric hospital at Crestwood, so my information is from our briefing earlier today. Uh, there are seven pediatric patients in the hospital. Um, I do believe a couple of those are in the ICU. I know UAB has reported an uptick you know, with 30, 40, and 50 uh, cases, and some of them in the ICU. So this can be a serious illness. I don't know the particulars of, of any of the, of the patients to be able to answer more clearly or specifically than that. Um, I think it's safe to assume that there's, just like in adults, it is, there are some apparently young, healthy people who, um, who contract the virus and do very poorly with it, and, and I would assume that there are some with kids as well. Um, this is a disease that gets into a family unit and manages to make everybody sick, uh, which is very difficult for families uh, to, to have to deal with. Imagine the series of quarantines that you go through if you've got small children and they don't all get sick at the same time uh, or they don't all test positive at the same time that your family is pretty much on the sidelines from everything uh, for weeks. It is, this, is a, this is a disease that's much better to prevent than it is to deal with. And then my follow-up question is, what would you say to unvaccinated people who are heavily relying on these monoclonal antibody treatments? I know that they work for vaccinated and unvaccinated people, but to the people who think that that is the answer. Um, well, in short, I'd say this is not the answer. Uh, the, the answer is vaccination. Um, the monoclonal antibodies are uh, a, a, way, a backstop, if you will. So if there is a breakthrough case or a case in a highly vulnerable person, the monoclonal antibody is life-saving. There are not enough of that resource to treat, to, to use monoclonal antibody like a vaccine. So it is um, time-consuming. Uh, you The infusion and intake is uh, over an hour, and then you have a one- to two-hour uh, observation period. So you can imagine you can't do thousands in a day like you can do a vaccine. Um, so it is, it, that doesn't, seem to strike any reasonable chord with me that you should say, oh, I'm not worried. If I get it, I'll get the monoclonal antibody. The phone calls that we've been getting um, of people who tested positive, got exposed, what have you, weren't vaccinated, um, it, is, it is very difficult. We can't meet the demand. 
Um, we've got uh, a core of nurses that are managing this and they're doing a hero's job, but there are only so many that you can give in a day before the nurses are, you know, you, you can't run it 24-7 for forever. So it is, it is a backstop for breakthrough cases, cases that, um, that we want to try to keep them from progressing to hospitalization. Uh, it's life-saving, um, but there's not, it is not a, it's not a replacement for the very effective, easy-to-get um, vaccine. Thank you. At this point, we'll finish the press conference. Thank you for coming.